Hey, what's up, guys? Chad Hermanson here with Metal Edge Training Coach. Today, I'm going to be talking with Jason Jarvis. What's up, Mr. Jarvis? How are we doing today? What's going on, Mr. Hermanson? How are you, buddy? <laughs> looking good. <laughs> you looking, looking super tan. Like you've uh, I know. on the golf course, huh? It, 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 it's, I'm just flushed because I'm with holiday excitement. But, you know, yeah, I've, I've been fortunate enough to get out and play a little golf. Luckily, the best thing I've got out of it is probably a little bit of a tan. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. I, I, I'm vouching for all my bald brothers to come on here and and make us we're representing, you know. You know what? You know what's really sad as I was I was, you know, since I'm just in the house, I was trying to work on the studio lighting because I did shave yesterday and obviously you can tell there is there's quite a glare. So I, I apologize. <laughs> it looks let it go a little bit. You know, it actually <laughs> You got your gray, your gray goatee. It looks like a it, white mohawk. It, I was gonna say, if I get it right about right, it almost yeah, looks right like a little mohawk. Yeah, right to stay there the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> the, the newest road. Right? Uh, yeah, uh, that's right. That's well, right. I you know, it's showing my age. I appreciate you my coming pleasure. Hey, we, uh, we first met um, that way back when I was I was 14 years old, um, had just completed my freshman year in high school. And we were starting Legion baseball, right, for the summer. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden, we hear about this pitcher that's coming to join us in the summer to help us, to help our team. Uh, new high school, trying to get, get enough bodies to play. And mm -hmm. still, that was back in the day when we still had Little League, as well as, because I played Little League until my sophomore year at 15. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Ruth, you came on board. Ruth, yeah. Do you remember that? So, I, I mean, I do, I was, I had just, you know, this is, this sounds really bad, but I had just completed my freshman year at the university of Utah, but I had graduated high school basically a year early. So I was a Legion baby. So I had just barely turned 18 and was able to still play Legion. And, and back then, unfortunately to date ourselves, there, there really wasn't college summer ball. There was, there was the Cape and there was Alaska and that was kind of it. So if you weren't one of the top tier you know, guys, then, then you probably weren't getting invited there. And then at that time I, I really wasn't. And so I still wanted to play summer ball. Um, I had an uncle who lived in Las Vegas. Um, I kind of felt like I had been there, done that in Utah. And then, you know, you hear about all the great ball players down in Vegas. So I talked to my uncle and we reached out and, and, and did some investigating and found out, you know, I could come down there and play. I was originally supposed to play with Bishop Gorman. Is, is who they were trying to get me on with Tim Chambers because he was there at the time. And um, it didn't work out because where my uncle lived was actually in the Green Valley boundary. And so when the Legion board or board of directors, whoever it was, kind of got wind, they were like, well, we can give him an exception to play, but he has to play in the area where he's living, which was Green Valley. So, you know, no big deal. I mean, I didn't care. I wanted to play. So I, I do remember my, my uncle reached out to the coach who was Jim Hampton at the time who ran the legion program for the summer and was like hey my nephew's here he's going to be staying with me for the summer he, he played you know he just finished playing college he'd love to come and play for you you know what do we have to do to get him on the team and, and jim was was quite coy <laughs> he was he was very nonchalant like look you know we're green valley we, we, I think you guys have just won the state title or played for the state championship your freshman year. I mean, obviously a lot of good ball players on that team and, and coming up through that program. So he, he basically said, well, we're practicing on Thursday. Um, if you want to bring him over when practice is finishing up, we'll, we'll have somebody stay around and, and we'll watch him throw and let you know what we think. <laughs> so I'm like, I, it kind of ticked me off, right? I'm like, are you kidding me? I just play in Division One baseball. You don't think I can make a Legion team? So I hey, this is the big leagues, it, man. You, 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 you <laughs> right. got to earn your stripes. 
<laughs> they, they really did. So I, I went out and, and I remember, you know, warming up and I, I got on the bullpen and they had kept a couple guys around to, you know, to, they, they just had me throw a little live on the field uh, to a catcher. And then they started throwing a couple guys in there to work hitters. And I think I punched out like eight out of 10 at bats, like right in a row. It was just like, boom, 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 boom. You know, I, I, I was, I was, you know, I was game ready as far yeah, as I was concerned. Wrong. I'm like, screw this. And so, you know, <laughs> but, so, so I get through that. And by the time I'm done, I, I can see Hampton and the other assistant coaches back there and they're just whispering and, and they're like, so you're going to be here all summer, huh? They're like, well, we have a game on Tuesday. Can you be here to start? <laughs> and so that was come kind on of the one, right? You're moving right in the yeah. slot. Well, La Rosa was there and, and he was good. So right. he did, he did joke. He's like, wait till I call La Rosa and tell him he's now the number two. Right. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but you know, he, he was great. You know, he, he did well. And then, you know, you weren't there yet cause you were still playing. And, and all I heard about was, ah, oh, well, Hermanson's going to be here Tuesday or her, whatever. What, cause you were swapping time between the other teams you were playing on. I think you guys were making a run with, with little league or the, you know, regionals and things yeah, like that as well. Like we were still and, Little and, League. <laughs> right? and so they're like, well, we'll have him Thursday, but not Saturday. And, you know, and I'm like, you guys are going nuts for this ninth grader. I mean, like, really, is he that good? And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's funny because, um, you know, obviously three years later, you know, first round pick, you know, you're, you're going out there. And, and I think I had just, I had just signed myself. And, uh, you know, I'm like, yeah, I remember that guy. He was great, you know. <laughs> so it's that, just a small world. It's just it a small world how it all works and comes around. <laughs> it is. That's crazy. So, yeah, that's interesting because I didn't know that that piece of it, right, that you had to yeah. – obviously, I guess that was how it would work for anybody. You got to you gotta show up, well, show what you can got. Yeah. You're like, dude, I just came from a, a pack – was it the Pac-12 then? Was it no, they they were they were the whack back then. So and and they weren't. I mean, you know, I, I love my youth. I'm a big Utah fan, but we were not we were not a a a power to be reckoned with on the baseball field. I mean, I think my my freshman year, I think we went 17 and 45, and and I was like four and one as a freshman. So yeah, we it, it was a lot of it was a lot of uh, uh, bumping and grinding during that yeah. year. <laughs> Yeah, you know what's funny is I don't remember a whole lot about that um, mm -hmm. that summer because I think we spent so much time. We went so far. I think we lost the championship in Western Regionals that that, that mm -hmm. year. Um, and then we went all the way to the World Series the following year. The following, yeah, because because you guys were not very senior heavy. Um, yeah, no you, you guys were all like, like you sophomores and then juniors who then went on that next year to be seniors. And, and you guys, you know, obviously were, were so talented with guys. It's, you know, a powerhouse to be reckoned with for years. So you guys were really loaded. Yeah, it, it was a lot of fun. A lot of good players came out of that. So now you, how did you get to Utah? Walk us back through your high school story. Sure. What was your route? So I went, it, <laughs> I, I have the, you know, the, the pre showcase, my, my parents didn't play, you know, they, they, you know, my, my dad was a huge baseball fan and did everything he could, you know, to try to make sure, but, you know, we didn't know about reaching out to schools or recruiting videos or going to camps or any of that stuff. Right. It was just kind of like, well, if, if you're good, they'll find you. And so, uh, you know, I played at a high school here in Utah, Beaumont high school, um, you know, I, I, I did well, you know, you know, all state and, and, and kind of got my accolades that way, but I had gotten all the way through, you know, my senior year and, um, and, and still hadn't heard from anybody. Okay. And so we, we got knocked out of the state tournament, um, my senior year and I'm, you know, thinking, well, maybe I'll go walk on it at Dixie or, or CSI or, you know, am I even good enough to play at one of those programs? <laughs> because I hadn't heard a lick from anybody. Well, Utah happened to reach out and, and pulled me up there. And what they told me, and I don't have any reason, I'm going to buy into this because it makes me feel better. But they had kind of told, they had kind of kind of put the word out, you know, because they're taking a lot of kids from the local JUCOs and things like that, too, that they were like, look, you know, hands off this guy. We want to make a run at him first once our season ends. And, and, and make an offer to him. And then if he doesn't, then, you know, then you guys can, can take a peek. So 
you know, I hadn't heard from anybody. So they kind of came at me. We did a, you know, home recruiting visit. They, they had me up on campus and then they offered me a scholarship, which, you know, was books and tuition, which, you know, for an in-stater, that's basically a full ride because I could live at home. I wasn't too far from campus. And, uh, I mean, I kind of jumped out of my seat at the chance because I'm like, yeah, you know, this, I, I, I don't know what else I'm going to do. So, yeah, I'll sign. Get, get me there. <laughs> so, you know, I, I wasn't having my door beat down. I was, I mean, and, and, and I look back on it now and I can be a realist on it. I wasn't, I wasn't, phys- I didn't pass the eye test, right? You know, you scouts and your eye test. I was, I was five foot 10. I was probably 142 pounds, you know, with my sweaty jersey on pitching during the summer. I was not a physically imposing guy on the mound. I threw pretty hard. You know, I was, I was 86 to 88 in high school. You know, I guess you'd say I was projectable, you know, thinking, well, he's got to get a little bigger, right? Put on some weight. Um, my, my freshman year, I, I grew three inches. I got up to like 165, you know, I'm 6'1", 165 pounds, which for me, I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting huge when I'm still looking like a fungo out there on the mound. And, uh, you know, the, the, my, that, that's kind of, that was kind of my path up to Utah. So, you know, my, my freshman year, they kind of gave me the look, we're not planning on playing you much this year. We're going to fit you in where we can. And, and, uh, I, it just, that didn't sit well with me. I'm like, if I'm good enough to pitch in some games, well, then why can't I pitch in all the games, <laughs> you know? And, and they were trying to kind of be careful with that, with that mentality, of, uh, you know, bringing a freshman along slow or, you know, whatever they're trying to do. So I went out, competed, did real well in the fall, um, got to the spring and it was kind of the same thing. Uh, I remember getting in my first game, I think it was at the University of Pacific uh, on a, you know, February, early March trip for us when we went down there and, uh, you know, got in there, got to throw, you know, my inning or so and mop up duty. We were probably getting our butts kicked. And so it was like, you know, seventh, eighth inning, Jarvis, get loose. You're going to throw that rest of the game. <laughs> well, I, I just kept holding my own. I'm getting all the mop up duty. Right. And, and as a hitter, you know, in, in mop up duty time as a hitter, I mean, it's, it's free swinging, right? You, you're hungry, you're ready, you're letting it fly on pitches and counts that maybe you're not usually, you know, uh, you, you know, you're not pay, playing the small ball game, I guess is what I'm saying. You know, you're taking some hacks, you're, you're swinging three all if the situation's right. And, uh, you know, I was going in and I was, I was getting out. I wasn't giving up hits, you know, I was, I was pretty good on my strikeouts to walks, you know, ratio. And so they kind of kept putting me in and putting me in and, and this went, you know, probably the first half to two thirds of the season. And, and I, you know, I was leading the team in ERA and mop up duty with, with obviously limited, you know, limited appearances. And so um, I finally, we were, we were playing a uh, four game series with Northern Colorado in Salt Lake. And I remember uh, coach Sofield at the time, he pulled me over and he was like, Jarvis, he's like, we're thinking about giving you a start this weekend. Would you be ready for that? And I, I, you know, hopefully my mom doesn't hear this, but, you know, I remember going, shit, yeah, coach. I mean, I was all pumped up and like, hell yeah, I'm ready, you know, and, and, you know, all 160 pounds and he's ready to go fight the tiger. And, uh, uh, they, they gave me my first start. And, uh, I, what's really funny is what the way the game is today. So obviously I hadn't thrown more than probably two, two and a third innings, probably, you know, 40 pitches or so, uh, at a time. And, uh, it, it, back then when they did double headers, they do sevens, right? And so I was throwing the second game of the double header on Saturday, which would be a seven inning game. And I ended up throwing a CG. <laughs> they just let me out there and just let me go <laughs> and ended up throwing all seven innings through a CG. You know, I think, uh, you know, I gave, gave up, you know, six or seven hits, a couple runs, but, you know, it was actually Northern Colorado who was kind of a lesser, I think they were D2 at the time came in and, and, and took three or four from us at home. And the only game we won was the game I threw. And then the rest of the year, you know, they, they kept me in the rotation. And, you know, I moved up to the number two spot, you know, the first day on Saturday, cause they did four game series back then. It was a Friday, double header Saturday, getaway day, Sunday uh, is how they did it. And, you know, I ended up being the first game starter on Saturday behind a senior that we had who did the Friday night game. So, um, you know, I, I, I battled, I competed. I just, I just never took no for an answer. You know, I didn't, I didn't sit back on the expectation of, well, they said I'm not going to throw a whole lot. So 
let me just, you know, be a little bit more reserved. I mean, every bullpen I threw, every inner squad that I threw, because there was a lot of them, you know, at that time, if I didn't get in the game that weekend, um, you know, I was out to prove, you know, bullshit, I, I should be throwing now. <laughs> so it, it was, it was a good learning year, learning year for me to just, you know, how to, how to kind of stay with it, stay focused, you know, and, and just don't take somebody else's opinion is what, what needs to happen. Yeah. That's interesting where, cause freshman year, I've talked to so many guys about freshman year, right. They come in and mm-hmm. maybe they're at a big school or it's just overwhelming. Maybe they came from a small program. Now you have these college coaches, maybe they're, they get on you differently than maybe a high school coach was very lenient with you. So you, there's that whole aspect of it of, man, coaches are getting on me. How do I handle that? Right. Yeah. And, then as a pitcher, being able to, to, okay, this is your role. This is what you're going to be doing. And you can, you probably agree, don't agree with it at first because it might not be a big role, but you put yourself in situations to where you build yourself to No, I I'm, I'm a starter. That's what I am. I may be mm-hmm. in right now, but I'm going to go out and shove in the coming in my bullpen experience and force your way um, into rotation basically yeah i'm going to take away your excuses to not put me in the game mm-hmm. like you know they're going to look at you like you're crazy for not pitching that guy yeah because that's that's kind of the chip i had to play with you know because like i said i wasn't you know i wasn't a number one prospect in the state i wasn't you know the highest recruited guy you know i really kind of had the i had to have that you know i may not be the biggest i may not be the strongest but nobody will outwork me you know kind of attitude because that's that's all I could control. That's all I could do. I would have loved to have been, you know, six four, six five, two twenty. It just wasn't. Uh, it wasn't in the cards for me. So you can only make do with what you got. And and I really did try to pride myself in in, in working really hard, um, because I didn't want that to ever be used as an excuse. Well, you know, we don't really see the effort out of you. You know, nobody was ever going to say that to me. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, they it, may it's, say I'm not good. At, they may say I'm not good enough, but they're not going to say I didn't work hard enough. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and, and that's definitely part of it, right? Because if you're a coach and you're saying, man, like you, you have like a coach meeting, right? And Jarvis just threw mm-hmm. it. Man, he was really good. It's like, okay, he just showed that. He's working extremely hard, you know, and we're seeing that. He's getting after in the weight room. He's doing all the things that are deserving <clears throat> of getting into that rotation, right? So those are the things that I, I'm still shocked at some of the, the things I hear in regards to the college level type player that mm-hmm. is not putting in the full work and it, it tends to, to happen to that freshman that is just kind of skating along and, and doesn't realize like coaches see everything you do right and, and they talk mm-hmm. that's their job they got to put the best team out there they're there to win so if you're yeah. not putting in the yeah. effort like it's an easy decision Yep, exactly. And that's, you know, I just felt like I didn't want, you know, I never wanted grades. I never wanted my attitude. I never wanted my work ethic to be something where they could be like, well, you know, you probably would have got the start, but we didn't think you were focused enough. You know, how, how, I mean, when, when somebody hears that, when that's something that's 100% within your control, I mean, I, I, to me, it just, it just, how can you not put forth the best effort every time? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so you had a, you said you went four and one your freshman year and, yeah. and then you, you left after that. Is that right? I, I did. Um, you know, it, it was, it was a, a tough, I, I look back on it now when it was kind of a crazy decision, again, not having any family who, who played any kind of high school sports or college sports alone, having anybody to really bounce something. I, I was kind of doing this blind. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, I look at this as a good thing because I wish more people had this kind of mentality, but, but I wanted to win. (laughs) I, 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 you know, I'm like, look, I don't care where it's at. I want to go to a program where I feel like everybody's committed to winning. And let's just say there wasn't that commitment with a lot of the guys, good guys, good teammates, you know, some of them, some of them work their tail off, but you know, you got to have 25, 30 guys pulling together and, you know, when, when, when guys are showing up hungover and skipping workouts and, you know, trying to do what's right when the coach is looking and then, and then screwing around when they're not, it, it just doesn't breed a great atmosphere. And I didn't like it. And I got, to be honest, I got tired of getting my ass chewed 
for their piss poor performance, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, and so I, I wanted to go somewhere that would, that, that was going to win. And, and it was crazy because I went from a, everybody talks about, Oh, D one, D one, D one. I went from having basically a full ride at a D one to an NAIA school in Omaha, Nebraska, Bellevue, um, and, and ended up having to pay about a thousand bucks a semester to go to school. Okay. I mean, you, you, you write that down on paper now and people would go, you did what? <laughs> <laughs> but to me, it just was one of those things when I, when I talked to the coach, when I listened to his, you know, to his, his sales pitch, to his goals, his values, the, the way he coached, I mean, he was, you know, it was with Mike Evans uh, out there who was one of the, you know, diehard, smartest, quirkiest baseball guys I've ever been around. I mean, I learned, I got better playing for him, far better than I would have with where I was at. Was it a bigger school? Would it may have been better opportunity, bigger limelight? Because I probably would have been the Friday night for guy, Friday night guy for two years, and I would have got all the games against all the big competition, you know, that we were playing against. Uh, but but I got so much better as a as a player and as a person going out there that uh, it, it, it was a no brainer for me as far as that goes. You know, they were an NAIA school. They were they were a baseball you know power as far as the NAIA goes. They were always in the top twenty five. They they kind of had a ton of D one retreads, right? Is that the right word? <laughs> a lot of guys that were at D ones, maybe they couldn't do it academically. They couldn't do it eligibility wise. They had issues with you know their attitude or broke a team rule and, and you go NAIA. Part of the reason why I went NAIA instead of to another NCAA school is because I would have had to sit out a year and I didn't want to sit. I mean, obviously I, I didn't, I couldn't sit half a season on the bench as a freshman. So the last thing I was going to do was go red shirt somewhere where I couldn't play at all. Um, and so that's kind of why I made the choice. And uh, you know, as the baseball stories go, I've, I've still got, you know, a ton of friends that I am, close contact to to this day that, that I played there with and everybody has everybody has an odd story of how they got there and and the road for me was the right road because I definitely got better uh there as a person and and like they said if you're good enough they'll find you doesn't matter if it's if it's NAIA JUCO D1 D2 D3 if you, if you can play from the pro side and, and you speak to this as well enough from your years of scouting they'll find you it doesn't matter where you're at yeah I know it, it's interesting because like if you were to make that move now, you know, if there's just, I don't know if it's, it's interesting. Like if you'd be mm-hmm. going to pack a head scratcher to, to <laughs> NAI, you'd be like, Hmm. Right. So there'd be a lot of question marks that would come up. Like why, what's the reasoning. And that, mm-hmm. that would be a part of a, a meeting with you individually, right. And to figure out, mm-hmm. you know, I guess just what your thought process was and what were your reasons for leaving and, and and it's not necessarily a knock on a player, but you just want to find out why, right? From a scout's perspective, because yep. um, it may not be a good fit, right? Or you, the coaches may just be, you just don't work together well, or like you said, the culture of the team. I get calls all the time from parents that are um, in that same boat, actually, that want to go from a, maybe a D1 and maybe, because actually you went through the situation too. And I don't know if it's the same situation with your son, but went from a D1, maybe this isn't working out to now I need to, in a way, go to a, a good junior college to get me playing, uh, maybe a better fit overall. Um, let's maybe we can talk about that now. So you have a son sure. Jake, sure. Um, who, who was a, a really good high school kid out of Basha High School where you're at in Arizona. Um, mm-hmm. That was actually how I ran into you again. I was scouting That's some right. players, um, Gage Workman. Um, I, I drafted a, a right-hander, Johnny Morrell, um, was one of yep. my first high school kids out of there, and then uh, Brennan Davis. So you, you had some yep. really good players out of Basha. Um, so I remember scouting them and running into you all of a sudden, and it had been years, and I'm like, mm-hmm. I was Jason, are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was like, yeah, it's, it's Chad Hermanson, and I'm like, Hermanson from Vegas Hermanson you know because there just isn't that many and they're like yeah he's a scout for the angels now and that's kind of how then it was like okay well they're always out watching our guys I'm gonna have to kind of keep an eye out and obviously we both look a little different 
uh, than we did back then. So <laughs> it's kind of like you look and you're like, I think that's him, but hey, is that Chad? Okay, yeah, okay, good. Then I'll go talk to him. <laughs> and then we did. We ran into each other at a high school game. And then, you know, obviously we crossed paths many, many times over the next few years, you know, scouting not only our guys, but but who we were playing because, you know, there's obviously a lot of talent over there. Yeah. Yeah. And so so he ends up going um, to Grand Canyon as a mm -hmm. out of out of high school, get signs with Grand Canyon. Um, just walk us through his story. What his uh, sure, his you know he he's got a little bit. It, it's one of those things, and 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 I'm super proud of him. You know, I'm I'm super proud of all my kids, right? You know, they they've all done so well and everything that they've done. And and you know, my older boy got into wrestling. I never wrestled a day in my life, you know. And and he took it on, and and I, you know, maybe kind of hemmed and hawed, like, you know, are you sure you want to do this? And he just absolutely killed it. Went from you know never never wrestling a day in his life to like placing fourth in state by the time he was a senior which was pretty impressive starting as a sophomore in high school you know my daughter you know with all her cheer and, and drill and all that kind of stuff and you know now she's at asu finishing up her degree and then and then jake you know obviously it's easy to talk about him because we're talking about baseball you know we're talking about about that path but he is you know he he, he is a mini me you know, as far as that concerned, except that I look up to him now. So he's, you know, he's got me by two or three inches and I still have him in the weight category, but that's not because it's good weight. Um, but, but no, he, he's a player. Um, you know, he's got all the God given athletic ability in the world. You know, he's got the body, he's got the tools, you know, for him, it's really just a matter of, of putting it all together and, and showing it live. You know, um, he had a, you know, he was, he was like you mentioned, I mean, they've had so many kids come through that program. I mean, his senior year alone, um, you know, they had seven kids committed D1. <laughs> and one of those, yes. and one of those that wasn't there that should have been was Gage Workman, who played and started three years at ASU and graduated a year early. So he should have been, him and Jake are the same age. He should have been on that team, which would have made it eight. And so they were, you know, they were a loaded team. And so you kind of had to, you kind of had to, you know, I don't want to say wait for your turn, but there were a lot of people in front of you to get there. So, you know, he always did, he always did well enough, but really didn't, you know, really didn't kill it until about the summer of his junior year is when it really kind of clicked where it was like, look, I'm tired of, of being in that, you know, in between category of, you know, is he our guy or isn't he our guy? And, and that's when I had to quit asking him if he wanted to go hit or throw or work out, Hey, you want to go hit tonight? Oh, I guess, you know, to where it was like, dad, I'm going to go hit. Could you throw, or I'm going to go meet so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so. we're going to go hit. And, and all of a sudden it like clicked and they start doing it all on their own. Right. And, and that's where you're like, okay, he's getting it. He's figuring it out. And, you know, he went into that, you know, his junior year, his fall, of course, you know, Brennan was tearing it up and, and him and Brennan were so tight, um, you know, Seth Beckstead and a couple of those others, you know, they, they, they really clung on to each other and they kind of became the three headed monster for that program their senior year. And, and he really went out and just, you know, killed it. And, and he, you know, he ended up getting player of the year for their, for their uh, region, which is pretty tough i mean we've got you know teams like hamilton and all the bellingers and them winning state titles all the time and uh you know perry and a lot of the great players they put out you know they had a really really tough region um and and he came out and and just killed it you know he he hit close to 500 his senior year uh you know started showing a little power knocking the ball out of the ballpark he also pitched you know which wasn't even what he went to college for but he pitched just because he was a good athlete had a good little yacker that was the only thing i could really teach him and uh and and he just he really just took it on his shoulders and and just went for it and uh, it was it was really really neat as a dad to watch him figure it out you know and and not have me be the one that was pushing him because i'm like look if i ever got to drag you out then it's time to be done playing like I, I i refused to do that you know i'd be like hey you should probably hit three or four times this week yeah okay but i would never take him out i would go if he asked but i would never drag him out because i'm like this isn't my career this is this is your career <laughs> this is for you i've had my time in the sun you know i have my stories it's time for you to go to go make yours so you know, he came out, it was kind of a late, late on the scene, as far as like the recruiting goes, kind of the same thing. It was his, you know, fall of his senior year is when he finally started seeing a bunch of the offers start to roll in after he had the good summer. And, um, and, you know, that, that was where he picked Grand Canyon, you know, great program, great school, great facilities, you know, was real excited to be there. And, um, um, 
you know, and going a little bit about, you know, his time there, he, uh, you know, as a freshman being an outfielder, I mean, they ended up, they ended up having three, all three outfielders signed mm-hmm. <laughs> that were playing ahead of him. So you can't really question a whole lot of that when you got three kids, you know, an eighth rounder and, and then two later picks that all sign well, an eighth rounder, a 14th rounder, and I think like a 28th or 30th rounder, you know, but all three of them were, were super high quality ball players and, and all had the chance to sign and, and went on to play pro ball. So, you know, that, you know, he, he got, he got, I don't know, 25 or so at bats. He was kind of the left-handed bat off the bench. Um, but he had to learn a little bit that year, you know, cause he was used to being the guy getting all the at bats. He was used to, you know, if I go zero for four, I'm going to be in the lineup the next day. And, 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 you know, college ball is different and, and competitive college ball is different. And so, you know, it, it's all about the quality at bat. And, you know, even if you're making outs, what are you swinging at? And, and he had a really good fall. Um, you know, have, he, he battled and started off really hot in the spring, but, when, when you stop getting those live at bats and you're only getting live pitching like once a week, you know, you, you kind of saw him, you know, he started, uh, I know he reached out to you a couple of times and you were great, you know, and talking with him to just kind of make sure. Cause I'm like, dude, it's not, it's not your ability. It's not your load. It's, it's not your swing path. You know, you just got to make sure you're down on time and, and that your head's in the right spot for what you're trying to do up there and then, you know, commit to it and, and make it happen. Instead of, you know, you kind of get in that guesswork, right, where, where you're, you're instead of being proactive to your swing, you're reactive. And, and, you know, darn well, once you start seeing guys with a little velo or a decent off speed pitch, you can't be reactive because it's too late. You know, it, it makes 80, it makes 85, 86 by you if you're reactive. <laughs> And so, you know, for him, that was a lesson he needed to learn and, and he's better now because of it, right? Because he had to, the, the one thing I'll say about him is he's, he's never had the golden spoon. He's never been, you know, he's never been the number one guy necessarily, you know, arguably on his team. He's always been a very, very good, solid player, um, but he always has worked really, really hard. And so what he, what motivates him is kind of the same thing. He does not want to be on the bench. And, and, and I think him and I talked a lot about that growing up and I instilled that, well, you better not let that bat be ever be a reason why a coach tells you you're not playing is because they don't think you're, you know, committed to the process. And so he, he's really, you know, worked his tail off. And even through COVID, you know, he, he's still five, six days a week. He's, he's in the gym, he's hitting, you know, he, he's taking care of business just like it's mid season. So, you know, if, and when we do actually have a season that, that he's not playing catch up. So, yeah, no, it's, it's cool. So he, uh, yeah. And, and we, I remember when he reached out to me, you know, we talked about some things cause it's hard, man, when you're, you're that freshman, right. You, you want to come in mm-hmm. and play right away. You want to have an impact. And when you get into that mode of being a dude, right, your senior year, and all of a sudden you're reduced to that platoon role, um, the left-handed bat off the bench, um, maybe a defensive replacement later in the game, that's hard to handle But when you first start mm-hmm. out, and it takes some time to accept it, um, and I don't know if you ever accept it, right, I think you just, you realize that's, I think, the- I, I think you, I think you, you, you respect the decision, you yeah. don't accept the opportunity yeah. you just don't want to, start. <laughs> to sit on the bench. Yeah. yeah. You just don't yeah. believe you're a starter. Um, it, it's funny. I remember that it reminds me of a conversation I had with John Vanderwall, uh, my rookie mm-hmm. year. He was right next to me and, and I'm 22 years old. Um, and he was uh, one of the best pinch hitters um, in baseball at that time. And I remember him telling me, he's like, he's like, yeah, I, I, I know this is my role, you know, that I'm essentially a platoon player, left-handed bat off the bench, but I don't believe that that's well, the only thing I can do. I believe I should be starting. So mm-hmm. that, that was his internal drive to keep him going um, and to be prepared because he ended up at some point, I'm, I was kind of very up and down at that point, but he did start for a while, you know, and he, and he was ready for it. Yeah. Um, but that's, you know, now, now you're talking to a, um, well, he's probably 19 years old, you know, a year or so ago, and you're talking to a young kid. That well, is- and, 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 and you get to the point where, you know, you, you, you start putting that pressure on yourself of, I have to have a huge at bat right here so that I'm noticed and I get more playing time. And then that's not a good combination because once you start, you know, kind of playing the, I'm playing not to fail instead of playing to do the best I can, 
it, it just everything gets out of whack. And 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 then you talk to him today, and he'd admit that. You know, we yeah. we talked to it. He's like, yeah, I let it, I let it get into my head, and I let it bother me. And the only thing I said is, great, you've recognized it. Figure out how to keep yourself from going back there, and you're going to be a better ball player because of it. Everybody's gone through that. You know, I mean, you went through it. Some of, some of the best of the best have gone through that. It's how they fight out of it that makes them why they're so good. You know, they don't stay there very long. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. And that's uh, and it's that's one of the hardest conversations you have with that with that type mm-hmm. of player. It's the freshman year in college because it's it's also an emotional thing for them, right? Because it's they're not used oh, to. Oh yeah. Um, they're how do I handle this? And then you you walk them through it, and you're exactly right. It's the they they take that importance of that one at bat they're going to get. And if they don't mm-hmm. succeed in that at bat, they put it's so much. You, if you go over four in one game, they're like, okay, but you go over one and you strike out in that big moment in the bottom of the eighth. Strike out. Yeah. Yeah. In the bottom of the eighth with runners <laughs> on first and second when with yeah. one out, when all you had to do was put the ball in play to score a run. Oh, the, yeah. the, the sun, the world is ending. The sun is not coming up tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you want to be the hero. You want to hit that pinch hit three run homer. Right. And so it's, you, you do yeah. think that you, you get out of your approach and what you're, you're trying to do. Yep. You, you get big, all those things that, that kind of add up to uh, not having a successful at bat essentially. So yep. you're right though. Yep. It's a learning experience and, and he's probably glad now a year later that he went through it because he probably grew so much from it. It sucks to go through and it sucks to watch your kid go through it because you know, you remember how bad it hurt, you know, your heart's just like getting stepped on every time, you know, that happens as well, but you're, you know, you're being positive and pumping them up. It's the, it's about the, it's the longevity, you know, that's not a sprint. It's a marathon. You got to turn the page and be ready for the next one. Um, but, but going through it, you know, now that he is a better, he's better because of it. And, and that's the thing that that's, that's, you know, whether it's, whether it's baseball or, or other things in life, you go through a tough challenge like that. You're better if you can figure out a way to get through it. You know, you're a better person, you're a better ball player. Um, and that's what's so neat about, about just sports in general, you know, especially baseball. I mean, it's, we've all heard it a million times. It's, it's, it's nothing but dealing with failure. So you really learn to appreciate the successes because they don't come as often as you'd like. <laughs> oh man, no doubt. Yeah. So, so he, yeah. he had a freshman year that, that didn't turn out the way he wanted it to. Um, then he decided to make a move and what happened after yeah. that? With, with, with the COVID shortened spring, you know, it, it was a little bit of a, you know, the, the coaches, I think, were honest with him. I think he handled it the right way. You know, they just kind of agreed to disagree, right? He, he felt, you know, like he shouldn't be platooning and, and he needs to be on the field because, you know, he, he, he's got some pro caliber prospect in him. And, and obviously, you know, you got to be on the field to be able to showcase that. And they didn't feel like they would maybe be able to c- commit to that. It is what it is. They have their choice with their program. So they just kind of agreed. They thought maybe it was another year away for them. You know, we, we, you know, Jake, I should say, kind of thought otherwise. He wanted to make sure he was on the field. It was a mutual kind of, uh, look, we think you need, because you do better with more at-bats. We're just not sure if we can guarantee you all those at-bats next year because we're not sure what's going to happen. So maybe while we still can, let's look at some junior college options to get you on the field. And and it, it stung a little bit you know, because he really felt like, like he could, you know, he, he earned that position for, he earned the start, the opening night start, um, uh, his sophomore year. And then it just, it just was kind of a platoon through the 16 games or so that they played. And again, then you start getting back into that rut of, I've got to go two for three today, or I may not be in the lineup tomorrow, you know, type thing. And so again, have to temper it, get back into what makes you good. But the COVID shortened season, you know, really just didn't allow anybody to really get going. So he ended up, uh, you know, deciding to leave um, on good basis. You know, Coach Stank, Coach Wallace, you know, they, they were, you know, really good with him. And they ended it on good terms, which is exactly what I told him, you know, don't burn bridges. It's too small of a, it's too small of an industry. Everybody knows everybody or is one person away from knowing somebody. So, you know, whether you think you're done there or not, you got to handle it like a man and handle it the right way, you know, look each other in the eye, shake hands and, and move on. You know, you don't agree to disagree if that's, if that's where it's at. And, and he did, and he ended up, uh, you know, talking to them about the junior colleges that are great in Arizona and they ended up settling on central Arizona uh, with coach Gillich and coach Perez over there. You know, they really, I mean, I, I think it was within hours 
of them hearing that that he was not going back to GCU, they were on the phone <laughs> calling along with a few others. And so, I mean, it, it literally was, you know, he called me and told me the decision that he was going to talk to Stanky. He, he came out of that meeting and I asked him how it went. And, uh, and, and Stanky, I appreciate because he, Stanky actually called me, um, you know, he, you, we don't have a lot of interaction, but he felt at least enough to, Hey, just wanted to explain our side. And we think the world of Jake and he's a great kid. It just, here's what we see, right. you know, and again, it's like, okay, and you, you have to run your program. I respect that. You know, we need to make sure he's on the field. If you don't think it's here, then, then we should look at something else. So he, um, um, so he ended up going over there. And, and I, like I said, it was like within an hour or two of, of him calling me back saying he had talked to Stanky, uh, CAC was on the phone, you know, South Mountain was as well. Uh, Yavapai, a few of the others, you know, big down there. And, and you know, they, they just were all over him. And, and, and he really, for him, it was really nice to kind of feel wanted. You know, you always want to go somewhere and feel not, not be handed anything. You know, we're very, very careful with that. You know, he's very good with that. He's like, I'll earn it, but just give me the shot to earn it. Have my back so I can go out there and, and, and earn it. And, um, you know, he had a, he had a, a good summer with him, a good fall with him, uh, tweaked the hammy a little bit. So playing time, uh, you know, was, was a little shortened than, than what we would have liked, but, uh, you know, he, he did great when he was in the lineup, was hitting the ball well with power and, and excited to see now, uh, what they'll do this spring and, and hopefully COVID stays away so we can get it in because it's killing me not having any games. I couldn't go to any of the summer or any of the fall games. They only allowed the players in and I, I think it about killed me. Yeah. No, it's, it's, <laughs> it's funny. As a player too, we're seeing it. Um, you're in Arizona, I'm in Vegas and, um, we just had another order of, um, you know, three weeks of you gotta yeah. cut that down. Stay at home. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so the kids are actually allowed to keep playing. Um, there's only a few games left for this fall, but they have, uh, you know, now parents can't go to the games. So it's just kids, mm -hmm. like 50 total people at a game. So just all these rules and regulations, parents are going nuts, kids are going nuts. Um, and it's, it's a testament to them because they're, they're they're going through something that's never happened before right and, and it's correct battling no nobody has a blueprint for this there, there's don't. no COVID yeah. off season plan yeah. that anybody's used for years and years that's tried and true <laughs> yeah and and i i i don't i'm not extremely optimistic about what's going to happen this spring you know with things going on um things things they seem like they're going great and then all of a sudden there's a huge influx of oh all these tests now and it's so it's hard to stay positive um mm -hmm. i know these kids are they they need to be given a lot of credit for how they're handling it um, and how they're battling through it because it's a it's about as big as an obstacle as you can have is to usually you're like okay i have this obstacle i just went over 10 but i'm at least going to be able to play tomorrow right because you play right. so now it's like well i don't know if i'm gonna play tomorrow you know because there might not be a game so it's yeah <laughs> Yep. Or yeah. Or a season. Or or are we are we going to play a weekend and then the team's going to test positive and then we won't play the next weekend and then you play, you know, is it going to be a hit and miss where you play every seven or eight or nine days and and what's that going to be like? So, yeah. uh, it, it it's really unprecedented. And then you mix in, you know, what's going to happen with pro ball and and their cutback on the minor leagues and what are the draft rounds going to be like and you know, it's it just kind of creating this backlog where you've got the, the fifth and sixth year seniors who are back with eligibility, only five guys or five rounds of the draft last year. So the rest of those 35 round of guys that normally would have gone are now stacking up and, and, and what's going to happen with them this year, if we only go 20 rounds and then, you know, it, it's, you, you're going to see a lot of that, you know, I think you've got to see a lot of that 22, 23 year old juniors, <laughs> Yeah. who are going to be getting selected eventually because I mean, what else were they going to do for those two years? Yeah. So and then they it's, get it's an unprecedented ball. time for sure. Yeah. And they get into pro ball and now they're a year or two older than they should have been. Exactly. And that's like, now you even on a shorter leash to produce yeah. and do the things yep. you need to. Yep. So, it, uh, you know, we obviously hope this clears up quickly and it goes away with vaccines are hopefully coming out pretty soon. And who knows if people will even take <laughs> it or not, you know, it's a whole different story. Um, but let's get back to you because you, um, you, you go from a university of Utah to this NAI school in Nebraska and, but you still get drafted because you said, you know, yeah. like you said, if you're good enough, they'll find you. So how do you get drafted? What's your story there? 
so, you know, our coach was, was very pro player. Like he was building his name with his program. So, I mean, he was talking, he was a great salesman too. I mean, he was, he was the first guy in your corner when a scout called, when a cross checker called, you know, if they wanted to meet up, I mean, his guy, if they were calling him about his guy, his guys were, were, you know, the cat's meow that he, he really, I mean, he would reach out as well. Like, Hey, you need to come watch this. He was kind of on the cutting edge back then of, of trying to have like scout days. Um, he would run because they were NEI, he would run a JUCO super tournament um, in the fall where we'd have like Iowa Western and Indian Hills and some of those other really good JUCOs from the Midwest that would come in and then we would play and they'd invite all the scouts out because it was, you know, kind of like some of the tournaments. They could see all these other teams play as well as, you know, they'd get to see us quite a bit as well and then kind of get on the radar. And that's where, um, you know, we, we scheduled we scheduled a number of D1s in our schedule that was fairly limited with who would play in any high school, but we would get some and, you know, you, you made sure that his, his best guys were stacked up against them. And, you know, it wasn't good enough for us to go out and win. We had to go out and dominate them, right. <laughs> you know, to really turn heads just because of the way that that level looks like. So, you know, I, I, I continued to grow. I continued to put on weight. You know, I, I started, you know, throwing pretty consistently in the low 90s, which, you know, back then was a big deal. Now it's it doesn't even get you on the radar. But, uh, you know, I was I was a 90 to 93 kind of guy with great movement. I had a big old, you know, big old breaking ball and a little cut fastball. And, and uh, I, I struck a lot of people out. I mean, I did. I, I, I had good control. I could throw my breaking balls at any point in the count. Um, and for that level, I, I, you know, I think I averaged almost two strikeouts in inning, and really kind of started turning some heads, you know, with the velocity in my build and, and finally, you know, was able to, to, to get a shot, uh, I actually got drafted by the Yankees. So that was, uh, you know, pretty cool to, to go to a historic organization like that. And, and, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they treated me real well. And, and, you know, my first year with them after I signed, I mean, I, I killed it. <laughs> Chad, I thought this pro ball stuff is so easy. It's so easy. Bats. It's like pitching. I mean, after, cause, I mean, 94, like 92, 93, 94. I mean, if you remember watching the College World Series, it was the home run World Series, you know, or the curveball World Series because nobody would throw a fastball because it would get launched 500 feet. And I mean, that was the, the, the epitome of the loaded bat era <laughs> oh, yeah. way before BB core. And so throwing the metal bats and then going to throw to wood was like the easiest thing ever. I felt at least that summer, because I mean, I was throwing pitches where I was like, Oh shit. And then you turn around and the outfielders just camped under it. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. I can get away with something. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. You, you actually learn that there is two sides to the plate, you know, because with metal bats, they cover the whole damn thing and it doesn't matter inside, outside, they, they knock it wherever it needs to go. But, um, um, with, with the rest of it, it's, uh, it's crazy because they, uh, they really, um, they really get hit good with, uh, um, that wood bat, you know, you go inside, you go outside, you know, you get rewarded where, where yeah. you never did with, with metal bats. I'm going to hurry and change my outlet on this because it looks like my computer's dying. I'll just pause it. Right, so, so you have a, so you had a good first year and you're killing it. And what was that? Was that at your short season facility? Were we, were able? Yeah. So they, they, they assigned me up to Oneana in the New York Penn league. And so I went up there and it was kind of the same, same scenario as my freshman year of college. You know, it was, you know, I came in as a 13th round pick. I didn't sign right away. Um, you had to get kind of through the negotiation and everything. So I got up there like two days before the season started. So they kind of already had their initial rotation and everything set up. So I got there and it was like, you know, well, you're going to be in long relief and, you know, we're going to see what we, what we end up doing. And, and guys have to kind of pitch to kind of start separating themselves with, with how they adapt in, in pro ball. And it was kind of the same thing. You know, I, I kept getting my opportunities out of the bullpen and, and just kept shoving, you know, striking guys out and getting out of jams and, you know, stranding guys, runners on base when I'd come in from them and, and, um, you know, just kind of had that bulldog mentality of, of, you know, put me in, I'll get us out of this. And, uh, I, I did real well. I ended up, you know, starting to get a couple spot starts as, as you have rainouts or guys get moved and, and how that goes. And, 
same thing. Just just took advantage of, of every single one so that I, I, I couldn't, they, they did, couldn't give me the reason why not to, why wouldn't we start this guy? Yeah. And so I did, I, I went through the Penn league, you know, I think I ended up, I was top 10 in strikeouts. I, I always joke with the guy who led the league in strikeouts that year. Cause he was with the blue Jays who I got traded to two years later. And um, I always joke with him because I got moved up to Greensboro, which was our, our, our A-ball affiliate in the Sally League. And I, I missed what would have been my last two starts of the year and still finished in the top 10 in strikeouts. And I kept telling him I would have had that title if they would have let me take my last two starts. <laughs> so, I, so, I, so I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, it was great. I, you know, top 10 in strikeouts, top 10 in ERA. Um, you know, was up there top 10 in innings pitched after starting in the bullpen, right. And not really accumulating innings, um, you know, so, so was, was able to kind of figure out the pitch count thing and try to go deep in games. You know, I don't think I had a start where I went less than six, you know, it was kind of six, seven, seven and a third, seven and two thirds is when you'd kind of hit that, you know, 105 pitch limit, which is what they had us on. So you really kind of had to learn to be efficient, right. You know, Try not to go three two on a lot of hitters. Don't don't let them foul it off. You know, have them put it in play three pitches or less. You know, really trying to really trying to buy into that philosophy. And if you got two strikes, don't waste the pitch. Get them out. <laughs> that was something where it was kind of that was different than kind of what I had always been taught. Right? Was oh two, don't give them anything good to hit. Well, it was like, you know, you look at hitters averages, 0-2 is when they have the worst average in baseball. Why would you want to waste a pitch and bring them to 1-2 where the average only goes up? What we should be thinking is make a good pitch, not waste a pitch. <laughs> yeah. You know, make your best pitch right here. And uh, and so I just kind of really just it, it, it just all clicked for me. And I had a really good year, got invited to instructional league absolutely tore it up I, i've got a great uh, i got a great Derek jeter story if you want to yeah. hear that one Love it. so jeter jeter was with the yankees he had been drafted a couple years earlier i think he had just come off his year it was the year before in greensboro he set the minor league record for errors mm -hmm. right because he he just he struggled and so you know, you see him and everybody knows, I'm sure as you well know, everybody knows who the first round picks are, right? Because they all have the targets on their backs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, Jeter's out there playing, sh <laughs> playing short. And, uh, you know, I, I was fortunate because Jeter, Posada, Rivera, um, uh, Pettit, you know, were all there at that time and, you know, had a chance to play with quite a few of them. So it, it was really neat now looking at what they did thinking back then did you have any idea or did you think that they were going to be that good and that's what I get asked and that's where the story kind of always comes up I was like let me tell you about Jeter <laughs> so again I carried over in the instructional league I'm dotting the glove you know I'm 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 about I'm, I'm consistently 92 93 now you know good movement still striking guys out now you've got guys from double a down through high a to the first year guys who are here and I'm, I'm still just throwing really, really well. And, and, and uh, I hadn't given up a run all instruction league and instruction league, you know, most of my outings were two, maybe three innings, but they were kind of keeping the innings down and just kind of working with you on things. So, you know, I would throw maybe twice a week, you know, maybe it was one inning and then two innings at the end of the week kind of thing is, is how they'd work it. So I'm out there. It's, it's, I think we're in like week five of, of, you know, weeks, you know, six or seven of, of, of instructional league. I haven't given up a run yet. I've got two outs, you know, Jeter boots a ball, throws it away. Guy goes to second. Next guy up. I think, I can't remember. I think I give up a bleeder. And so now I got guys on like first and third. Now we got a ground ball, make the good pitch, ground ball up the middle. He goes, tries to do his little field it and spin throw, sells it throws it down the right field line, two runs come in to score because the runners are moving with two outs. And I give up my only two runs, all of instructional league off of his errors. Yeah, they were unearned, but, but I, I didn't want to give up a run. I wanted like, I didn't care about the earned unearned. I didn't want to give up a damn run. Right. And so I give up two with him out there at shortstop. And I called one of my college roommates after that, when he checked in and he's like, yeah, I heard you you know, they got their hot shit. Number one pick there. You know, how did, uh, How's he, how is he? You think he could play? And I just went off, you know, I, he's terrible. I don't know what they see in him. He's made so many errors. He's never going to make it in the big leagues. It's just ruthless. I can't believe they signed me for this and they signed him for a million dollars. You know, I just, I'm just 
you know, my head was probably redder than it is right now. You know, I'm just ticked, you know, and uh, obviously, you know, I figured the room must have been bugged because the next year they traded me. He went up to the big leagues. And of course, you know, now he had just the most amazing career ever. Right. One of the best stops ever. So, I mean, just, so it just goes to show you, that's why I'm not a scout. <laughs> yeah, man, you'd have been terrible. No, but that's I funny. Been, I, I, I would have passed on Jeter. <laughs> <laughs> this guy. Yeah. No, that's interesting. I, I, and I guarantee you, I, oh. I went through that same thing in, in, <laughs> double A as a shortstop and lost games because I was throwing the ball away and uh, I guarantee you so I had some pitchers that said the exact same thing like this guy can't well, be short yeah <laughs> and and my mom and and my mom like my mom's little pet talk god bless her soul you know my mom's little pet talk was when you're in little league oh well wait till you get to high school they'll make all the plays well then in high school it was well wait till you get to college and they'll make all the plays though you'll have better defense there and then in pro ball it was like well wait till i don't know what else to tell you babe just keep throwing strikes <laughs> <laughs> In double A, they'll start making them all. Don't worry. That's right. That's right. That's right. Oh, so that's that, that 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 was my good Jeter story. Nice. Did you ever throw to Posada? Um, I never, I never pitched to him. He actually was there. Um, he was rehabbing a knee injury, so he wasn't really. Um, he would do some bullpens, but I never threw in the game to him. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's pretty cool. Though, and, Re and Rivera was actually R Rivera was actually rehabbing back from a Tommy John that he had in the minor leagues. So he was down there because he was rehabbing back from Tommy John surgery. So he was just barely starting up his kind of like, you know, white bullpen throwing and trying to get ready for the next spring training. Okay. Very so, so how, if we, let's dive into the, your mental side, because you mentioned you played with a chip on your shoulder. Um, it sounds like just knowing you and your personality that you were probably very aggressive on the mound, like attacking. Mm -hmm. How would you describe oh, yeah. the mental side for you? Your well, I, I just, I, again, I knew I wasn't the most physically talented guy. Guys threw harder. Guys were bigger. You know, I thought I had decent breaking stuff. You know, I thought my breaking stuff would, would stick with anybody, but you know, I, I didn't throw the hardest and I wasn't the biggest. I wasn't the most intimidating guy out there. So you know, how was, what was I going to do to set myself apart to make the hitter wonder, God, this guy, you know, what is this guy thinking up there? Because he just, I just don't think he's got that much, you know, I'm trying to do whatever I could do. So, you know, I was, I was a very, um, you know, kind of like turn it on, you know, everybody gets in their routines. You know, I would, I would, I, when I hit that foul line, it was like, it was like head down, stare at the grass, walk out to the mound, get the ball and, and just focus in on the catcher. I couldn't have told you if there was, you know, 10,000 people in the stands or, or 500 people in the stands. And it, it really was, I was that locked in, in with just what I was trying to do out there because, and, and it was get the ball and go. I, I really wanted to, I really wanted the pace, you know, to find that rhythm. You know, you talk about like in a bullpen, you throw a pitch like every like 15 seconds or, you know, 18 seconds or whatever it is. So in the game, if you, you know, and if you're feeling really good in the bullpen because you're getting repetitive and you're able to keep going with it, then why take so much time between pitches on the mound? I mean, I was kind of of the mindset, you wanted to mess me up, keep calling time, right? So, so I wanted to get the ball and I wanted to go. I mean, I don't care if they hit, I, I was almost like catcher, give me a sign. I don't care if he peeks in and sees what it is because he's not going to hit it. You know, I'm, I'm going to catch him some way. I'm going to locate it better. So even if he knows where it's coming, I want him to swing. I want him to roll over this. You know, he's not going to barrel it, but I wanted to keep my pace. I wanted to keep that rhythm going. And all that started, I felt like, you know, it started here. It was a mindset, you know, it was an attitude that, that I, I had to practice my, I mean, it practice like you play. I mean, I did the same thing in my bullpen. I did the same thing between innings. I did the same thing when the game started. So there was no difference as far as mindset, you know, went and, and as far as that goes. And so, you know, I, I really had that, that feeling that um, even if he knew it was coming, if I located it in the right spot, he still can't hit it or he's not going to hit it well. And so that was really, you know, that was the chip I felt like I had to play because I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a huge bonus baby. I, I wasn't, you know, like I said, I, I wasn't the most physically intimidating guy that everybody was going to be like, oh man, he should go just because he, he just, he just looks like a ball player. Yeah. <laughs> you know? ball and, and so, yeah, right, right. I couldn't even grow facial hair back then. So <laughs> 
I mean, I, it was funny. I found some of my old minor league, like the pitchers, they, they used to do like the actual photo packets that you could buy in the minor leagues, right? Where they'd have pitcher day, like school pitchers. And, and my mom made me buy them, you know, because she wanted to see them because it was pre-internet. It was pre-cell phones. It was pre-video, you know, enhanced and all that kind of stuff. So that was like the only thing they really got to see in the uniform. And, uh, and I looked at them and good Lord, I mean, wow. <laughs> Chad, I, I don't even scare myself. And I knew what I was thinking. <laughs> a baby faced little blonde punk haired little kid. So, yeah. uh, so I just, I did, I went right after hitters, you know, that was one of the things, um, you know, we had uh, Paul Falk uh, was our, was our Yankee scout who got assigned to the short season team to help coach and evaluate the players for that summer. Like they do in a lot of the times. Uh, East Coast guy and and uh, you know he was great because he talked a lot to me about ah, you know what I Jarvis he's like I just can't figure you out he's like you know what I don't have you rated real high on all this but damn it I want you on the mound when we got a game to pitch because you get on you pump the zone with strikes and hitters don't know what's coming and you know I was kind of like strike one strike two what are we going to do here you know strike one foul ball now let's put him I was really I really had a knack at that point at those levels at, at putting hitters away. Like if I got you with two strikes, it was like, do you want to strike out on this? Or do you want to strike out on that? You know, what do you want? And, uh, and they, uh, and I just, you know, as long as I could get them to that where they were defensive. And, and so a lot of times it was fastballs go right at them, you know, don't try to be fine. Don't paint, don't get yourself in trouble trying to nibble and falling down too low. And then you got to serve a cookie that, you know, somebody's taking swinging out of their shoes for get ahead early, make a pitch early, because even if he hits it early in the count, you're not running your pitch count up and you're, you're not tiring yourself out. So if you got to give up a hit, give up a hit that first pitch, you know, a lot of most hitters, unless you're really, they're looking for it first pitch. They take a lot of first pitches in pro ball. I mean, that just kind of seemed to be the mindset. What hitter hitting, why would you want to swing at something first pitch if you're not comfortable when you get three strikes? So I hear that and I'm like, well, great. Let's get those first two out of the way then. So now you have to hit with two strikes. You know, why do I want to paint an OO fastball when I want to get a little bit more plate and just get strike one? And so I really tried to use that to my advantage. And, and I think I was a good pitcher. You know, what, what I lacked for in the blazing fastball, I, I made up for, you know, kind of being a good cerebral pitcher, you know, knowing what I had and knowing what I needed to use my stuff to get people out. Yeah, that's good to hear because I see a lot of guys that have that stuff right now. And we talked mm -hmm. about even, even 90 from a scouting standpoint, that's a four on the scouting scale. So, which mm -hmm. means that's a low average, 92 yeah. average, that's a five. So if you're pitching from a 91 to 93 area, which is good as a starter, knowing when to throw it, you know, how to mix up your pitches and knowing when you're seeing how to create, yeah, how to create some deception with your motion. Yes. You know, that was kind of the thing I always got is I was pretty good with my motion of hiding the ball. It didn't look like I was throwing even as hard as I was. But when hitters would get in the box, they'd be like, you know, when I'd ask them for feedback, they'd be like, it just feels like it's on you. Like, it's almost like it gains speed as it gets closer to the plate, you know, it like, like, so that's where it was like, I would get, I would get swings at 90, 91 that looked like 95, 96, just because I had a little bit of deception to help because I had to create it. I wasn't going to all of a sudden, you know. Unfortunately, I didn't jump on the steroid bandwagon to gain the five, you know, miles per hour on my fastball. So I had to try to pick it up in other ways. Uh, and so you had to pick up that deception and, and try to get something that would help make it, make it look faster. It doesn't have to be faster. Make it look faster. Yeah. That's an interesting topic. I'm, I'm yet to discuss that era because you were, you're a few years older than me. Uh, we played through the steroid era. Um, what, what was your take on that? And did you, were you competing against, we'll say pitchers? that you, you knew were on this stuff and, and how did you at, at, at the time, honestly, Chad, I had no idea. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you'd talk to them. I mean, you'd see guys that would come back and, and, you know, they, they look like Greek gods, right? It's like, what did you do? Compete in like, you know, bodybuilding competitions all off season. You know, I'm eating 7,000 calories, you know, drink, you know, drinking a hundred gram protein shakes and 15 chicken breasts. And I came back like five pounds heavier, yeah. you know, I, I'm so sick of eating. I can't even do it. <laughs> and, and these guys are coming back and, and they're, you know, 27, 30 pounds of sheer muscle 
And the guy that was 88 to 91 is now 95, 96. And he goes from being a nobody to flying up the ladder. And for me, my thought was, man, who are these guys training with? I must not be working hard enough. You know, what do I need to change up? Cause, cause they're just saying, Oh, I fixed my eating. And I started working out with this guy, you know, five days a week. And, and you know what? Granted with steroid, you do have to work out. You do have to put in some time. It, it, it doesn't just happen because you take a pill or you give yourself a shot. You do have to work fairly hard to get the results from it. It does obviously make it a little bit easier <laughs> to get better results. But it's not like they sat around on the couch and, and you know, took a shot in the butt and, and, and all of a sudden picked up six miles an hour on their fastball. I mean, there is a little bit of effort that went into building that kind of a body. But, but I had no idea. It, it wasn't talked about in the clubhouse. I mean, it wasn't you're, – you're looking at guys and talking to them about what they did. And, and, I mean, I look back and I know now guys where I'm like, oh, yeah, he was so on the juice. You know, this guy was on the juice. This guy was on the juice. This guy was on the juice. And, you know, I've, I've talked with my boy about it, you know, and cause he's like, well, why didn't, would have you, why didn't you do it? And I was like, well, honestly, I didn't even know, but if I did, I'm like, I don't know if I would have made that choice or not. I can't honestly tell you that I wouldn't. If, if somebody told me at that level, when you're, when you're battling for your life, you know, your professional life and every roster spot, Hey, this would help you pick up four or five miles an hour. Because for me, if I was a 95, 96 guy, instead of a 90 to 92 guy, I'm a top three prospect in the organization instead of a top 20 guy. Right. I mean, cause at the time, 95, 96, I, I threw, I, I remember, I remember on, in our organization seeing three or four guys that were 95 plus consistently. Right. Maybe, you know, and that was it. And I don't know what you recall when you were playing, but there just wasn't that, I mean, you know, like you look at the Rays bullpen this year, right? I don't think they ran a guy out that was touching less than 96. Yeah. They all, every major. Less than 96. Now it's just I a, mean, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't have three or four guys in the whole organization that threw above 95 consistently. Yeah. They touch it, but with, you know, that, that pitched at 95, 97, something like that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for me with, with my off speed stuff that I had and the movement I had on my fastball, I mean, that, that would have been the difference between me being Jason Jarvis or, or an interview like Greg Maddox is how I looked at it. Who knows? Maybe, right. maybe it would have put me over the edge. Now, is that the right thing to do? No, I don't think it was, but at the time it's, it's a moral discussion to have. And, and, you know, ball players that are, that are fighting for their lives, you know, I, I, I hope I would have made the right decision, but I, I don't know, you know, it would have been a tough one. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and I, I felt the same way, you know, you go, you go just bust it for three, four months in the off season. Maybe, you know, I was, a, I had a hard time putting weight on in general, just being a skinny. Me too. And if I got to, me I, too. I usually got 10 pounds on me um, in the winter. And then by the time two weeks was into spring training, um, maybe even three, like it was almost all gone. Um, yeah. you're just doing doing a lot of different things and but yeah no that's that's interesting we haven't talked about that much yeah. um but there's i know there's a lot of players that i competed against for the same positions um that no doubt were were just because and and some have admitted it and then, and then the um what was it the balco report all those things that came yeah out, um the, and yeah then, yep that guy i knew yep 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 and you just keep checking things off well, and, and now that you know a little bit more about it, you can see body types and kind of see what's, you know, what's, what's pharmaceuticalized and, and what's natural. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, and it's, and I, and I think guys are, they're much better at taking care of themselves. Um, oh, you have to be. It's, you know, better, like, like I saw Jake down at a um, push performance, you know, just yeah. doing different mm-hmm. types of exercises and then it would be a different way of training um so kind of combining that and these smaller movements with maybe more like where i was just like a bench and a squat guy right and we didn't mm-hmm. we just kind of tried to balance as much as we can but we didn't have the balance of those smaller movements right mm-hmm. kind of the balance the stabilizers all those type of things you know, well up. plyos you know plyos med balls all that stuff was just starting to make its way into pro sports at least for pro baseball you know my second third fourth year you know rick peterson 
you know, legendary pitching coach, been around forever, you know, with Carl Kill, kind of made his mark with the A's. And then he was actually the Blue Jays minor league instructor when I was with them. And, and he was the one that really kind of revamped our whole like off season and in season workout, you know, protocols. And it kind of went from weights to like med balls and plyo bendings and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, just like that overnight. So it was just kind of hitting the cutting edge of now what everybody's doing at, at such a, a crazy level. And it's gone even, even more in depth, you know, since then. So the, the, the training information that's available for athletes these days is, is unbelievable. I mean, it really is. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Jar, this has been awesome, man. This is a lot well, of I appreciate it. This is a lot of fun. Yeah. I love your story. A lot of fun. Um, hopefully some, uh, college age high school students can get some out of that with um sometimes you got to transfer sometimes it's not the best fit you know it's you, just not a good fit you gotta yeah, use, you gotta, you're exactly right it, and, and i it's think just not the, a, it's just not a good fit the biggest advice that i would recommend and also reiterate is what you said is if you do end up leaving uh going from a d1 to a different school is you don't want to burn bridges you don't want to you don't want to leave that school you might be pissed. You might be upset that you have to go do mm -hmm. it, but you know, coach Stankovic knows everybody and yep. that, that, that college coach that's going to ask like, Hey, what do you got on Jarvis? He's going to, well, say, you know, it, it, it to, to add a little bit to that real quick is we're wrapping up. So he's talking to a couple of schools right now, right. You know, for, for hopefully after CAC um, that, that he's getting recruited by pretty heavily right now. And, you know, one of them knows Stankowitz. And so guess what they did? They called Stank and said, Hey, give me the story on this Jarvis kid. You know, what was he like? And, and Stank gave him a raving review. Right. He was like, look, we, you know, we, we kind of got caught up in numbers. He's like, I, you know, I just, I couldn't get him to respond the way that I wanted to, you know, you know, from like a coaching standpoint, it just seemed like they couldn't get the click, which is, you know, that happens. We all know that. And, but he was like, if somebody can reach him and, and tap into his ability, he was like, the kid's going to be a superstar. And so that's what his ex coach told the new coach that's trying to recruit him. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you call him a bleepity bleep bleep as you're walking out the door and heck with you and you know tear up the locker room, how do you think that conversation was going to go? And now you just cost yourself a potential great opportunity that you were excited about. You, that coach isn't going to call you back. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I heard this guy has a bad bad attitude. So, yeah. you know, it, it it's coming full circle right now as we speak. So yeah, and I so yeah, I mean that that's the advice is when you know there's going to be that meeting, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you know, there's going to be that meeting, you have to make sure you have your emotions in check, you know, and yep. almost, almost play it through your mind. Like what could possibly happen? You know, in that, that conversation may smack you in the face. You're not expecting it, but knowing, okay, there's a chance that, you know, that I have to leave, you know, being okay with that and kind of coaching yourself on, on how am I going to handle this? Right. Mm -hmm. It's going to probably go through that and ask me some questions. Um, keep my emotions in check. Right. And, and be in control of yourself and then just let it play out and you're going to be better off basically. Yeah. <laughs> and then just because somebody has an opinion doesn't mean it's right. Correct. You know, I mean, I'm sure there's guys that, that you passed on that, 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 you know, maybe did well in another organization, you know, that you just didn't see it because the days you were out and you were watching them, you just didn't see the, the, the love for it. You know, you didn't think he projected like, you know, you maybe saw him in the 10th to 15th round and these guys picked him up in the second or third and you kind of scratch your head and maybe the, you know, for every story about that where somebody did great, there's another one where they bombed, <laughs> you know, <laughs> nobody knows for sure. So, you know, the point is, is just because somebody gives you their opinion doesn't mean they're right. That's just their opinion. It's okay to disagree, you know, just handle it like a man, Absolutely. you know, shake hands, agree to disagree and walk away. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, awesome, Jason. Yeah. I appreciate it, dude. Yep. Have a, enjoy your, uh, your Thanksgiving. Congrats to your boy on his commitment as well. That's awesome. That's exciting. Thank Have, you. and, and, you know, I, I hope the, I hope the uh, Thanksgiving's wonderful down there in Vegas and, and I hope you eat a lot. We'll work on our off season weight right now. Absolutely. Yeah. We're going <laughs> to, we're going to put on, it's, it's the hot, you're carrying a little holiday weight, right? Yeah. One of my favorite lines from yeah. friends with Ross, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just call it my COVID-19. Yeah, COVID-19, <laughs> COVID-20, right? Awesome, man. We'll, uh, we'll keep in Great touch. You, buddy. Come out to Vegas. Let's play golf. And Absolutely. 
best of luck to Jay. Tell him what's up, and we'll be paying attention to that. And, and I want to wish you the best, man. Will do. Thank you very much. Pleasure listening to these. Keep them going. All right, man. Take care of yourself. We'll talk Have to a good you. one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That was an awesome conversation with Mr. Jason Jarvis. Good dude. He's got a good kid coming up in the ranks. And I just always love just hearing the stories. You know, Derek Jeter, you know, that story was pretty cool. Um, I just love the, the baseball community and the, those that are willing to come out. And, and when I ask uh, to come on the show that they're willing to do so, reminder that I am also coaching athletes one-on-one. -on -one. If you would like to schedule a free consultation with me, for 20 to 30 minutes, go through the goals of your player. My email is chad at mentaledge.coach. Um, so email me, we can schedule that and we'll see if it's a good fit. If uh, the goals and commitments and uh, the level of, of desire to want to get better at the mental game all fits, I'd be happy to work with your athlete. Um, also, you can go to my website at mentaledge.training where you'll see my online membership uh, where I have a video vault available for you. This is, I would say, more for those that just want to learn on their own time, uh, share those videos with you. I'll have weekly or bi-weekly calls to help you guys as you go through and learning the videos and how that's working for you. It'll be Q&A sessions so we can just talk, have conversation with all the other athletes as well. So I appreciate you listening to this episode. Hopefully you learned a lot and I'll see you in the next show. Take care.